F1 is a place for people who achieve things they once thought impossible. Bernie Collins is one of those people. When Formula One was being shown years ago, they weren't showing the pit wall. You were just thinking of the driver, and I knew I wasn't going to be a driver, so I just didn't really think about the jobs that were possible in Formula One. I didn't imagine a strategist on the pit wall deciding when the pit stops were happening. You just didn't think about that. Fast forward a few years, and the unthinkable became a race-winning reality. This is really happening. You are really watching Sergio Perez win in Sakia for his first ever Formula One Grand Prix victory. We knew it was the fastest strategy. It's the easiest decision I've ever had to make on the pit wall. I felt relief that we'd finally got the win for him. Hello and welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. At Force India, Racing Point and Aston Martin, Bernie Collins pulled the strategy strings, preparing for anything, reacting quickly to call a pit stop, constantly balancing risk and reward. A race winner with Perez at Racing Point, she rose to head of race strategy at Aston and helped Sebastian Vettel score his final Formula One podium before she stepped away from the pit wall midway through 2022. Today, Bernie uses all of her experience to analyse the on-track action as a pundit for Formula One and for Sky. And she's very good. She just knows racing and how racing drivers think. And there's plenty of that insight in this chat. But we also discuss how she gained all of her knowledge and the unusual route she took to becoming a race strategist. A job she says she didn't set out to get when she was studying in Belfast. Plus, there are stories of working with Jensen Button in her early days of Formula One and the time she engineered McLaren CEO Zach Brown when he was driving in a sports car race. Bernie's engaging, she's funny, she's interesting and she's very direct in her opinions. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Bernie. (laughs) <laughs> thank you for coming on the show. It's great to see you. How thank are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Very good, thank you. Are you enjoying civilian life away from the stresses of the pit wall? I'm definitely enjoying civilian life. It's been a very nice break. It's been nice to not be into going to every race, especially because the season's been pretty grueling, I think, this year. So it's been nice to have a few off. It's been nice to watch a few at home or the few I've managed to watch down the pub. It's been quite nice just to have like an overall view of everything and not be so embedded for it for a little while has been really good. To actually see 20 cars on the grid and not only two. Yeah, exactly. And because you sort of end up watching your own little race with the people just ahead and behind you and be fit to see all of it again has been quite nice. Do you miss the adrenaline rush, though, of the pressure of the pit wall, making decisions on the spot, on the hoof? A hundred percent. Like, I really loved what I did. I loved my job. I love being on the pit wall, part of the team. I really enjoyed the team I was part of. So it was, that was a real difficult thing to walk away from. And you miss, it's going to sound really selfish, the influence that you have on the race. So before I made a real difference to the outcome of the race or what happened for that team, you know, particularly, you do miss that getting on the pit wall, making those decisions, knowing what's going on. Like from the outside, we can make assumptions about what's going on but actually knowing what's going on is very different has your view of formula one changed since you stopped being with the team i don't think necessarily my view of the sport has changed i'm more aware of the fans views now that i wasn't before because i wasn't doing so much reading of social media or um the press or what's going on around it because you're so focused on what you're doing you're not doing all of that So I've got more of an understanding of an outside view of things than I had before, but I don't think it's necessarily changed my view of the sport. Well, for people who are watching the 2022 Hungarian Grand Prix, you're the person that Sebastian Vettel was referring to when he asked over the radio. Can Bernie hear me? She can. Jesus. I nearly forgot. (laughs) Thank you very much, Bernie. Thank you for, uh, well, I was only there for two years or one and a half with you, but uh, it's been good fun. You're a great person. Thank you. Big kiss. She's gone very red, Sebastian. She's gone very red. Cheers, mate. Yeah. All the best. <laughs> Bye. It was your last race for Aston Martin. Yeah. And Sebastian wanted to give you a public thank you. Yeah. Did that mean a lot? 
It would have meant more if he hadn't retired and stole my thunder on the same weekend. <laughs> it's the same weekend, wasn't it? But yeah, you know, to have someone of his stature, he came in a four times world champion, very strong persona, very well respected in the paddock, and has often in the past been so critical of strategy that that was a real sort of, oh, how is this going to go moment? And then for him to sort of embrace what we did and get behind it and be on board with it. And then to have that sort of relationship to the point where he was grateful for the work that you put in, that was, yeah, felt really special. Um, and it's nice to have been respected to that level. How apprehensive were you? Because you're right, some of Ferrari's strategies, he did get stuck into. And I'm thinking, I think there was the, the 70th anniversary race at Silverstone. He was very critical over the radio. How did it feel working with him? Do you... Judgment day kind of thing. Yeah, when he, you know, when he first arrives, you know he's coming to the team, you know he's going to be there for testing. Obviously, as a strategist, I didn't go to testing, so you don't immediately start to build that relationship. And then you're trying to go through some races that you've done in the past and start him understanding how we make calls on things, why we make calls on things, how we build our tyre model, how we form our strategy, how we interact on the radio, all these things. So it was very daunting knowing that he has been so critical in the past. And even in the strategy meetings, still he would ask a lot of questions, very on top of what's going on, really wanted to understand the plans. You did feel a bit of a spotlight on strategy in that moment just because you wanted to get off on the right foot. It was very important to start off on the right foot. And, you know, we did we did that pretty successfully, I think. And he was definitely a lot um, kinder in person than what I'd expected. And maybe that is just expectation managed. But, you know, the relationship was really great. What stood out about Sebastian? What made him a strategist dream, if we can call it that? Two things. He had a very good understanding of what you're trying to achieve and why it might or might not work. And he had a very good memory for what had happened in the past you know he would you'd often have gone through some previous races and he'd say oh what about like in I don't know like 2010 I was like I've not looked that far back so then you'd have to go and look at that one you know a lot of the great drivers which Sebastian did could really build a picture of what was going on around them and what you were trying to achieve in a strategy so he could imagine you know the lines that we have in the paper as it was happening in real life. So he would be in constant communication with you on the pit wall? Yeah, so he would always communicate through his race engineer, but he would always be discussing what was happening in the strategy. And you hear it a lot from those drivers that are fit to watch a TV screen and say, so-and-so has pitted, I've seen them come in the pit lane on the TV, I know what's going to happen next. And they're building the image of what it's looking like. What you're saying about Sebastian, I think, says two things. One is, clearly, you were very good at what you did, but also... The relationship between strategist and driver is clearly very important. And, and I'd like to look into both of those things. First of all, let's talk about you and strategy. In the hierarchy of a race team, where does the head of strategy sit? Yeah, so it varies a little bit team to team, let's say. But generally, you'll have a head of engineering or a head of trackside performance, whatever the name may be given that sits on the pit wall, who's responsible for the performance of both cars and generally strategy sits within that group so you'll report to you know whoever that is on the pit wall that head group that's overall responsible for everything that's happening at the track generally you'll report into them and generally that that head of strategy role is aligned let's say with race engineering or with the race engineers but actively making a decision in the race engineer although may question it doesn't generally go against it are you an engineer in your head or are you a mathematician um, or are you both? Well, yeah, I'm more an engineer because that was my degree. My degree was engineering, whereas most of the strategists on the pit wall, their degree is mathematics. It's a bit of an abnormal route that I've ended up taking to get to be a strategist. Was it quite a gulf to make, make the jump from engineering to strategy? Yeah, 100%. Because... The thing with engineers, and probably mathematicians as well, but with engineers in particular, is we like an exact answer. So when I was doing performance engineering in my previous role, there was a break balance that was right. There was a right answer to the question. And in a lot of engineering, there's one right answer, and that's what I like about engineering. Whereas in strategy, there's a lot of averaging of lap times to get a degradation, or 
averaging of um, track improvement. And there's a lot of statistics and averaging and probabilities and things that don't sit well with the old engineer in me who likes an answer. And that took a lot of adjustment. That took a long adjustment phase between the two. So how much of the work that you do over a race weekend doesn't get used? Loads of it. So like the way I explain it is that (laughs) if you think we can look at a boring one-stop race or, you know, even an exciting one-stop race, but our one-stop race, and it appears like the strategist makes one decision, whereas actually we make decisions every lap. Every lap we're deciding to stop or not stop. Every lap we're deciding if there's a safety car, what we would do. Is that all pre-planned or are you... Or are you, are you coming up with solutions on the hoof, depending on what's going on around you? Yeah, there's a mix of both. So you'll have started with your grid position, what you think your tyres are going to do, what you think the track's going to do, and you'll have a plan. And, you know, we hear the plan ABCs, whatever. And you'll know for one of those plans when your safety car window will open. So if you're just following that plan, then, yeah, you'll open the safety car window about the right time. But based on who's in your safety car window or how the track's evolving or the feedback from the driver or things. These are all evolving. So they're changing all the time. So every time you're, every lap you're trying to recheck your model, recheck where you're at. Is everything that you start, thought at the start still apply or have that, have things changed? You know, and often it's, there's an accident or an incident or whatever that changes it, but you're, you're continuously reevaluating that, which is what makes it tough. Is this what Tom McCulloch, who's the engineering boss at Aston Martin, is this what he calls situational awareness? A hundred percent. Like, does he? Did he use that expression? He uses that expression <laughs> a lot, and he uses the expression, you know, big picture. You've got some big picture people on the pit wall who aren't in the numbers; they're just observing. But yeah, it is about being aware of, you know, what someone else has done around you, how they're likely to react to what you're doing if they're having a bad day or a good day, because you can go into the race and think of who your competitors are likely to be, and actually that might change quickly during the race. Or you might be on for a better result, and sometimes, often it's more difficult to recognise the better result that you're on for. And Bernie, are you naturally a risk taker, or are you quite conservative in your approach on the pit wall? It's interesting when you you ask that question directly after asking (laughs) about Tom, because one of the things in strategy and engineering in any of the pit wall stuff in any of the engineering side is you need to understand your team so I was probably quite risky so in qualifying if I thought that we were safe I would be more inclined to take the risk and not run again so I'd always be on that side of things a little bit in my mentality whereas Tom was always more conservative and you needed that balance right you needed one of us to play off the other. So I knew that if he thought we were safe, we were definitely safe. And equally, he knew if I thought we weren't safe, then we definitely weren't safe. So you get to know the personalities you're working with. Bernie, that's an interesting point. So it's not just the races as well. You're involved in run plans for qualifying, even even practice as well. I think there's lots of people who contribute because if you think of going into a race, there's lots of answers that a strategist wants before the race. You want to check your pet loss. You want to check your tire model. You want to check all these things. So it's up to me to ask that those things get done in practice sessions and to push that we get the answers to what happens in practice sessions. So, you know, obviously the engineer has some time to set up the car. The driver needs some time to practice qualifying. But there's lots of questions that you need. Now, some of those are standard questions that we try and answer every week. But sometimes it will be, you know, is four or five laps on the soft enough to work out DAG or, oh, you know, Things have changed. So, yeah, you're, there is this mix of people trying to get different answers out of those practice sessions. And, you know, most importantly at the moment, trying to decide which tyres you run in P2, which is the most likely tyres you're going to run in the race, which tyres do you not need any information on, what do you need to see for Saturday. There's so many things that you end up feeding into. Hiring new employees can be challenging and time-consuming. But what if I told you that finding and recruiting great talent for your business doesn't have to become a stressful second job? You can hire faster and better with Indeed. There's no need to spend hours creating and sharing posts on multiple job sites because with Indeed, you can attract, interview and hire all in one place. It's an unbelievably powerful hiring platform delivering four times more hires than all the other job sites combined 
according to Talent Nest 2019. And it's filled with powerful tools designed to find you matched candidates with ease. That's what I like the most about Indeed's hiring platform, how efficiently it streamlines and automates the process. Its instant match technology shows you candidates whose resumes listed on Indeed fit your job description immediately after you post. In fact, Indeed data in the US shows that over 80% of employees get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. And candidates you invite to apply are three times more likely to submit an application than candidates who only see your post in a job search. Indeed is the only job site where you can pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. So don't get left behind. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to update your job post at indeed.com slash the grid. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at indeed.com slash the grid. We're talking at the Las Vegas Grand Prix. Yeah. New racetrack for everyone in the pit lane. Uh Does that make this even more stressful than normal? The way to think of strategy through a waste weekend is you go in with a pre-event model and every session you're trying to build confidence in an element of that pre-event model. It might be pit loss, it might be tire degradation, it might be the car pace, it might be what what other tires people have. So every session... And then into every lap of the race, you're building more confidence in the model you're working to. And in this race weekend, in a new race weekend, your starting model is very poor. You know, you're totally on simulation. You don't know what the track's going to be like. You don't know what the improvement's going to be like. So there's lots of things that is really uncertain at the start of this weekend. And you're still, you know, removing uncertainty lap on lap, but you from a much per starting position so experience counts more at a race like this than a a Barcelona where we've been a hundred times before I think so and a lot of it is reaction and a lot of it's being very regimented in how you split the resource so for example in FP2 if you don't get a good read in pet loss then you need someone working on that on the race for another car or whatever there's lots of that you need to be very split in the race about Who's looking at what elements? What are you going to be fit to eliminate quickly? And what are you working on? The most effective teams will do well at a new race. So at Aston Martin, how many people do you have back at the factory supporting you? Do you call it mission control? Yeah, mission control. I think a lot of people call it mission control. In the strategy group, I think a lot of the strategy groups work the same. You've got a head of your strategy or some other title on the pit wall. You have one strategist per car back at base. So there, one will be looking, in my case, at, Sebastian and one will be looking at Lance and they'll be looking at you know their pit windows and their lap times and then you'll have one or two others that are looking at competitor analysis or other aspects of strategy and then for race day in particular you end up with something like three to four volunteers that are listening to the radio comms of other teams or looking at the videos of other teams so on race day you end up with a team of like seven But in normal strategy land, you've probably got a team of like three. I wanted to ask you about some case studies. So do you know if there is a safety car on lap seven, what you're going to do before the race starts? You'll have a pretty good idea based on where you think you will be on lap seven. So what you think the gaps will be to others, what you think your pit window will look like what you think the life of the final tyre will be. So you'll have a pretty good idea. Okay, so let, let's let take some real-life instances. So Russia 2015, right? Yes, okay, you bought Checo pits <laughs> on lap 12 yeah. during a safety car. Yeah. And then has to do something like 41 laps yeah. to the end of the race. What made you pit him then? Because it was a big ask. I know he's the tyre yeah. whisperer, but it was still a big ask. It right? was a massive ask. I think that we realized that was our best chance of a good result. So it was worth the risk. And it was possible with Chaco because he was so good on the tires, but it was way outside our tire life. Like when he pitted, did he know that he had to get to the end of the race? We knew that that was what we were going to try and do, yeah. But that wasn't planned in advance. We'd had a pit window which is limited by your life on the final tire. 
But you get to that and you think, this is the only chance we have of getting some really good points here. And we just go for it. And you hope that he can manage and extend. And I don't actually remember what he came back on the radio with, but there was a lot of, you know, hoping that we would make it. I really hope that we would make it. I'm sensing this was definitely a Bernie Collins strategy call. I'm imagining Tom McCulloch sat next to you going, oh my God, Bernie. (laughs) I actually actually think that, because I'd only started a few races earlier and only started doing strategy. So I actually think a big, big part of that podium is down to Tom. And do you need sign off from someone higher up the chain like Bob Fernley when you're doing a risky one like that no so Aston had a very good protocol um where strategies left to strategists setups left to engineers whatever and if the call proved to be wrong then we would discuss it afterwards we'd go through it and review it and analyze it but never in the time that I was there did Otmar or anyone of that sort of level come on the radio and go, oh, I wouldn't have done that. Nobody did that. That was all left for analysis post-race. Now, when I started, obviously, because of my inexperience, a lot of those discussions were managed between Tom and I. And, you know, I leaned very, very heavily on Tom at the beginning. And then gradually over the years, that equalized more. But no, above Tom, there was no interaction. You know, me. I think probably Tom was getting a lot more feedback than I was <laughs> on some sort of direct channel to him. But it never came to me. Bernie, let's fast forward a year yeah. to Monaco 2016. You've got your feet well under the table now. Yeah. And it's Checo again. He qualifies yeah. eighth. You yeah. get him to third ahead of Vettel's Ferrari and Rosberg's Mercedes. Yeah. It was wet, dry. Mm-hmm. It sounds to me like this was the perfect Bernie Collins race. Well, <laughs> again, that was one where I actually always felt I was reasonably strong in the wet, but we've like, we've had recently some terrible wet races. But that was one where we boxed Hulkenberg a lap earlier. He actually emerged behind a Williams that was trying to get from wet to dry and stay out. So he lost loads of positions. So it was one of those ones that got away from Hulkenberg where actually he was ahead of Checo at the time. And he finished sixth still in yeah. that race, didn't he? Yeah. But it was what you know, it was one of those what could have been for Nico. And then Checo actually on the in lap, the next lap, said, I think we should do one more because he'd seen that Nico had got caught behind the Williams. So we extended the first one, we extended the wet to inter a few laps and managed to overcut some people. And then on the inter to dry, we were very aggressive, which maybe I could take more credit for, but definitely not the wet inter. So the inter to dry, we were very aggressive and undercut some people in that one. Checo was totally right because Nico had got caught behind the Williams, but we were expecting the Williams wouldn't try and extend the wet tire. That was so outside of our thought process at that time. When you talk about Checo is he one of the best drivers you've ever worked with because I feel his reputation's taken a bit of a hammering this year alongside Max Verstappen I think his reputation has taken a hammering and I think when we went into the start of the year he was very strong and I was surprised at how strong he was against Max and Checo you know I 100% have a soft spot for Checo because Checo for many years was the person scoring points in the team doing things like the Russia strategy, doing what was asked of him in terms of things. It was very easy to work with in terms of going through the analysis afterwards. It was very easy to work with if you had a bad qualifying because he would immediately turn it around and be good for the race. He's not the driver that Max is. Max is a much stronger driver. He's probably not the strategist that Sebastian was because Sebastian is a much stronger strategist. But he was very good at the tyre management stuff. And he worked very well with his old engineer, Tim, and improving his qualifying. At one stage, he was very poor in qualifying, which was definitely his weakness. So he worked at improving that. So, yeah, I would say Sebastian's probably the best driver I've worked with. But, yeah, I, Chaco in that team with the pit wall group that we had, that's not that much different today, that pit wall group, did a lot of good things with that car. I'm interested that you say Chaco can have a bad qualifying, come back, talk to his engineer, and have moved on by the race the next day because 
one of the observations I got of him this year is that he did get himself into a slump that he couldn't get out of. But yeah. you're saying he back then well, he was capable of moving it on. It was amazing back then. You know, I, I don't even know the example, but there was at least one point where you have a bad qualifying for whatever reason. I, can't, I don't even remember why the qualifying was bad. I would always come into the office a bit deflated, like, that's not what we expected. We, we want it much more. It's going to be a difficult race, whatever the case may be. And very often, Czech will be in there already going, right, what are we going to do in the race? We're starting like P18 or whatever it was. I was like, I've not even got over the negativity yet. And you're already asking me how we're going to fix it. Because you've obviously not simmed a P18 star or whatever. I always felt that his, particularly his family around him, he had a very strong emotional resistance at that stage. Obviously, it's very different when you're the driver that's scoring the most points. Is a very different situation to Red Bull. Do you think he's one of those drivers, a bit like Giancarlo Fisichella, who was brilliant in a small team, close-knit bunch of engineers around him, put him in a big team and perhaps a little bit overwhelmed by, by the pressure and the situation. Well, the Nowhere question, to hide. Yeah, there is that. There is... It, and if you think of like your own self, it must be much easier to be leading a team than struggling behind. Week in, week out, it must be much more confident to be getting good results, getting good points, doing well in qualifying, whatever the case may be. That must feel better than being second driver. And the number of people that have failed in that Red Bull seat, Albon, Ricardo actually did really well. You know, the number of people that are like Gasly, there's so many people that haven't done well in that second Red Bull seat. I can imagine it from an engineer inside on the pit wall. When you're outperforming the car, it feels very successful. And even if you're achieving the same results, but underperforming the car, it feels very unsuccessful. Do you think Lance Stroll is going through a similar process at the minute at Aston Martin alongside Fernando Alonso that, that Checo is going through alongside Max at Red Bull? I think Lance gets a bad rap for you know his father owning the team. And I think it's very hard to remove that aspect when judging his performance. This year, his performances have been poor. And I don't think that's, you can argue, you know, particularly since the cars got worse. And I think one of the things, you know, potentially Checo in, in Force India was probably underrated. So then when Lance wasn't beating Checo, Lance is even underrated and even more, which is why I think there's been this drive to bring in Vettel and now to bring in Alonso to bring in, you know, a driver that is very highly rated, such that if you can get some close results, it brings up the overall rating. Um, and I will be interested to see. I don't think we've had a good feel of him to Alonso because of what's happened through the year. He does need to work at it more than, you know, the likes of Alonso or Vettel. There's one more Checo race I wanted to ask you about. Okay. And that, and that is Sakia 2020. The win. The win. The win. But the spectacular Bernie Collins win. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible Grand Prix with Sergio Perez. Round turn four where he was spun round on the first lap and he just seemed like a driver possessed today. This is really happening. You are really watching Sergio Perez win in Sakia for his first ever Formula One Grand Prix victory. Yes, Checo. P1. Yes. The risk takeover because, you know, he qualifies fifth, I think it was. Yeah. He then collides with Leclerc on the opening lap, drops yeah. to back of the grid. Last. 18th yeah. or la la yeah. dead last, wasn't well, it? Well, last apart from the two that had retired. Mm. Yeah. How did you win that race? That was an interesting race because we did Bari in the week before. The garages haven't moved. The pit walls haven't moved. Your hotel hasn't changed. All these things haven't changed, but the track is now very different. The pit street looks the same, turn one looks the same, but the track is very different. The track has very, very different requirements now. So the first weekend's high degradation, the second week's low deg. The first weekend's very easy to overtake because of the high deg. Second weekend isn't. So the first weekend is multiple stops and the second weekend isn't. You need to get everyone aligned that this is a very different race. It's not a normal bar in anymore. A lot of people, I think, were still thinking of multiple stops, still thinking 
of, you know, in the final safety car that they should box and put on new tires. Well, we were thinking the deck's quite low, whatever. And it was one of the ones where we were forced to start on a soft because that was a regulation then because we qualified so well. But we always work out what we would start on if we'd free choice. And we knew that the soft wasn't the quickest tire. The medium was the quickest tire. And we knew that a medium hard one stop was going to be much quicker than the soft hard one stop that we were on. So we knew all of that before we went into the race. So on lap one, when Chaco crashed, everyone's trying to figure out if the car's damaged, if we need to do a pit stop, what we need to do, when we need to do it. And actually the information came back that the car was fine. We didn't need to do a pit stop. But we did a pit stop for the medium tire because we knew it was the fastest strategy. And even when Chris, who was engineer at the time, turned to me and goes, are you really sure about this? I was, it's the easiest decision I've ever had to make on the pit wall. I was so confident it was the right thing. How could you be so confident? So just to remind the listeners, we're on the outer loop of Bahrain. Yeah. As you say, completely different racetrack. Yeah. We were still fact-finding, even come the start of the race. I'm amazed that you were so sure. Because we we knew that the degradation of the soft would mean it was not the quickest tire. And we were last, and there was a safety car anyway, so we had nothing to lose by making that decision. And you had full buy-in from Checo? Yeah. I, I think there was very little time to have full buy-in from Jacka, <laughs> but we knew we knew like we always work out what our bailout tire would be if we had to do a pit stop. So if we had to do a pit stop, we knew it was going to be a medium. That was already decided. So the only decision was we don't need a pit stop. We don't need a front wing. We don't need any of these things. I was still a hundred percent the right thing to do. Like the car was quick and Jacka was quick, so it's not just down to that strategy decision. But it it would have been much more difficult without that strategy decision. And then the next strategy decision being at that final safety car not to do a pit stop when lots of other people did a pit stop. I find it amazing that all you strategists, I'm assuming, have the same information available and yet some do a much better job than others with that information. I know the cars are different. I suppose that's a huge factor. I mean, I remember one engineer in a rival team, I probably won't mention his name, but we were talking about strategy and he said, tell you what the best strategy is make a faster car. <laughs> <laughs> that is like the one of the running jokes is strategy is easy when you're fast. And to a good degree, that's true. Like even for the years that we were the fourth or fifth fastest team, but the others were a step behind. It just gave you a bit of margin. You could get your pit stop lap wrong. You could not do that well in qualifying or it was easy to go through Q1 or whatever. It just, the faster the car, the easier strategy becomes, I think you know, maybe Red Bull disagree, but it does, you've more margin, you know, they can do a two stop and others do a one stop and it's probably going to be okay. So, th- so that is is difficult. We do all have the same information. We we spend a lot of our time on average lap times of all of the cars, average degradation, that sort of thing. But it is how you pull it together and I think it is how you react and deal with that within the team and how you best sort of build your case for what you do going forward. And one of the things that we did very well, I feel, was our analysis. We analysed everything so carefully. And one of the things in F1 is you can analyse nine other teams as well. So if they made a mistake, why did they make a mistake and how do you avoid that? And if you're not learning from their mistakes, then you're not learning as quickly as they are. So Checo crosses the line. His first win in Formula One, I remember chatting to him in the press conference after the race and very happy Checo. Yeah. Relief. I, get, I think relief was the overriding yeah. emotion yeah. for him. How was it inside the team? Well, it's one of those things that you know the race is going well and you know that you're on for a good result, but you're always struggling to believe it might actually be a good result. And then obviously Mercedes had their bad bit stops, which is, you know, actually why we won. But you're just sort of hoping on hope that it's going to be okay. That was one that we won by a good distance. We won by like 20 seconds. Checo had lost his drive. We didn't know that he had another drive somewhere else. He'd been with us for so long and it was like quite an emotional sort of few weeks. It was a triple header at the end of the year, at the end of the COVID year. It felt like tiring and and I felt relief that we'd finally got the win for him. This episode is sponsored by the all-new Mercedes-AMG GT Coupe. So striking, so AMG. This car looks compact, powerful, flowing surfaces, sweeping wheel arches. 
The front looks fantastic, and one thing that's really cool is the digital light headlights, which can project things onto the road ahead of you like navigation guidance and warning graphics. We all know how important performance is, and this second generation of AMG's flagship is the first to feature all-wheel drive. It's got active aerodynamics, roll stabilisation and rear axle steering, so the handling is precise. You can put this car exactly where you want it through the corners. The all-new Mercedes-AMG GT. So striking. So AMG. Coming 2024. Learn more about the all-new AMG GT and the AMG portfolio at mbusa.com slash AMG. How does resource help you in the strategy department because i mean you've kind of lived through all the different stages you join force india you know and then we go through the administration yeah. and all the frustrations associated with that and then suddenly there's cash flow how much easier did your job get when you you became racing point and, and then of course but it's, Aston Martin? it was happening gradually for years when i joined the reason i ended up doing strategy is i joined aston martin or Force India, as half performance, half strategy. And at that stage, the strategy group was Randy, who's now at McLaren, and Ollie Knighton, who's been at Force India since forever. So the strategy group was one full-time person and Ollie, who does it part-time. And I was there to help the strategy group and help the performance group, so like a middle person. So that brought the group from one and a half to two people, let's say, but it was one and two halves. But as I joined, Randy left. We had two race overlap for Randy to teach me strategy. Having never done strategy before. Because Randy was going to McLaren. So we had one race where I went in and watched him. And then the next race, he watched me. And then the third race, he was gone. My half performance, and all I wanted to do was performance. I didn't want to do strategy. I just took the job because it was half performance, half strategy. Tom was like, well, now you, 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 it's going to be pretty much all strategy. I was like, okay, fine. It was still only me as a full-time strategist who had no experience of strategy and Ollie. We went from this one and a half people doing strategy when I started in 2015 to, you know, when I finished being four people, full-time strategy. That's massive in terms of what you can do, in terms of work and practice and you can develop the tools you can develop how much analysis you can do like everything it was massive and just even simple things like then when as you say money came along we were getting better bits of software or having more you know we were fit to do more radio comms or more video clipping or everything was just becomes easier much easier and I always had this massive list when I started of things that we should be doing better but just no time to tackle it and then it becomes this point where you are crossing stuff off the list which feels really nice so the the analysis gets better but do the results get better I think yes and I think we improved how we were doing it and doing it in a more reliable way and becoming more resilient if I wasn't there you know, we were definitely building resilience within the group. The results probably indefinitely on paper weren't getting better, but the car wasn't getting better. I think as a team, we were operating much more efficiently in a much better way because you're doing more races. It's harder on everyone, so we're fit to really keep it going. And the expectation grew massively. So it felt like not as much fun. We had a lot of fun at the start. And I suppose with expectation comes pressure. Were there ever moments where pressure got too much and you made wrong decisions for reasons that perhaps you wouldn't have made in the early years just because there was too I much going on? Tom did a very good job of sheltering us from that pressure. So the race team were allowed to operate very largely like the race team had always operated and making decisions for what we felt were the right reasons. Obviously you do feel more pressure, you do feel more expectation and it's harder to make decisions selfishly for the team, maybe against Lance's side, for example, you know, but you always have to be fit to defend the decision to yourself at the end of the day. So you have to always do it for what you believe are the right reasons. 
How different was the culture at Team Silverstone compared to McLaren, where you started your Formula One career? Massive. <laughs> massive, massive. Like at that stage, the sizes of the teams were massively different. I think McLaren was going through a bit of a political time at that time when I left. I didn't realize how much I wasn't enjoying being part of the McLaren trackside team until I left. There was a lot more pressure in McLaren. It was more political at that time. It has definitely 100% has changed now. I can see it in the people at the track. That it's a very different culture now to what it was then. But then there was a lot more of a blame culture when things went wrong rather than the let's figure out why it's gone wrong and let's make sure that doesn't happen again. And that was throughout the mechanics, throughout everything. There was much more of this, oh, let's just cover up that mistake and hope that nobody finds out type thing. So it was a very different culture. It was my first full year racing. There was a lot of pressure, self-inflicted as well as from the team. But, and you know, as I say... I think McLaren has changed massively since then. But I moved from this big corporate pressure cooker to this family where there wasn't enough people to do all the work. So everyone was just getting stuck in and doing whatever they could to make the car go faster and make the results better. So it was a, 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 such a different environment. Oh, and hence your job description when you arrived <laughs> yeah, was so broad. It exactly, was kind of, yeah. it, could, it, it like, said performance engineer and strategist, but it could have just said everything. Couldn't yeah. It? And I think, you know, that actually made my career in a way because I wouldn't have been offered that opportunity at a different team. You know, no one would have put me in as, you know, the sole strategist on another team. And that was just a team with less resource where you had to get involved in all these other things. And you, you, it was very broad, your description was at McLaren. It was very narrow because there was someone for each role. And at the time, you know, I was told by McLaren I wasn't racing in 2015. I didn't decide not to race for McLaren in 2015. And then I decided I didn't want to stay in the factory either. So then I left. But without that sort of forced decision, I would have never left and actually... The leaving and the moving was the making of many things to come. We've talked a lot about the drivers you've worked with, uh, particularly Vettel and Checo. What about Jensen Button? Because he was your man at McLaren. Yeah. He was a world champion at the yeah. time. Um, what was impressive about him? The thing that impressed me with Jensen was he was very, both him and the race engineer would take the time to explain things to me because I was new. So if I was suggesting a different brake balance or differential setting or whatever he would take the time to go through why that wouldn't work or why he thought it wouldn't work so he was quite calm and we did that year together I think it, it worked really well I found him very easy to work with um, and to give suggestions to he won't like me saying this but he didn't like being told what I thought so I used to just leave it on like a piece of paper like with the <laughs> This is, this is where you're breaking wrong, you know, just sort of like highlight it and just leave it there and he'd see it himself. I know you weren't his strategist, but I'm sure you're aware of the conversations going on. Do you think Jensen had a, the complete picture as well in the way that Vettel did? I think he did. And I think it's hard to remember because you weren't as obviously as engrossed in those conversations. But I think he was strong in that. And I was always impressed by how much he could take in. And I'm still impressed by a lot of the drivers, how much they take in from the TV. You expect when they're racing that they're not watching the TV, but they are. And just with all the switches that you're asking them to do and everything else that's going on in the car, it's impressive that they're, you know, also on the start finish straight going, oh, I've seen that so-and-so pitted or so-and-so retired or whatever the case may be. That's, that level of awareness is pretty exceptional. Do you think the pressure that we've talked about at McLaren was perhaps born out of having two world champions? Because you obviously had Button... And Hamilton, I suppose, when you were first there, and then yeah. Checo comes in for a year, I suppose. So you, you, yeah. that's when you you, you and first then the year that to him, the but. year that I was with Jensen, it was Jensen and, and Kevin. I just think that they were a team at that stage, or in the years prior, that had struggled. We did a few years of struggling to get the car right. A few years where, you know, they'd won the world champion, or that you know they'd had Lewis and whatever. And then they had years where it was a struggle and it was just trying to rectify that struggle, I think, that ended up with this, 
even, you know, in the design world or the aero world, this sort of blame culture of where it's gone wrong or why it's gone wrong. And that just got this sort of negative spiral for a few years until they got out of that. So I don't think it was necessarily the pressure of the world champions. It was just that the car wasn't performing at a level that they were used to. Mm -hmm. Best form of strategy, have a faster car. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> How did you end up at McLaren, Bernie? Because it's, it's a great story. I mean, Formula student. So I did mechanical engineering at uni because I didn't know what to do. So I really enjoyed math and physics. And I thought, oh, I don't know what I want to do as a job. So let's just do some engineering because that's quite broad. And I can still do loads of things at the end of that. But then halfway through my engineering degree, I started forming a student, which is a single seater race car that universities build and race against each other. And as we were going through that process, I sort of thought this is quite nice because you get to do some design work, you get to do some build work, you get to um, drive the car. We, you know, we drove the car at Silverstone two weeks after the Grand Prix. It was the first time I'd been to Silverstone. Um, and that experience made me realize that actually that suited me. It was a good mix of theoretical and build work it was like a good of everything and on the back of that I was encouraged to apply for the McLaren graduate scheme so my lecturer that actually ran the former student program encouraged me to apply and it was a bit like as you're going through the, la the layers of the graduate scheme you're just sort of thinking oh let's see how this goes so it got to point that 10 of us went to McLaren for an assessment center there's actually me and another guy I went to uni went then you do the assessment center but it's in MTC, so you get to see this fantastic building and everything. And we were both a bit like, we've got to see Ryan McLaren, like, that's fine. We're sort of happy with that. And then I was called back. I think there was, I don't know how many were called back for, like, individual interviews, which are the most, that is the most difficult interview I've ever done. What was so hard? We were given, there was a guy who did the vehicle dynamics at um, McLaren, I think he's still there, give us this really technical question I don't think there was ever a way that you were going to get it right, but it was to show how your mind worked, how you could work it out. You're trying to go through this problem solving thing. Um, and it was ju I just remember thinking, God, that is so like, I don't know how I've done in that. And then I had, so I had this real tacky bit. And then I had a like sort of sit down interview with um, Paddy Lowe and Jonathan Neal. And it was just really, ra it was just really random. It was just felt like this different world. That proves how seriously McLaren were taking Formula Student. If, you know, Paddy Lowe and Jonathan Neal are two of the most, were two of the most senior people in the team. It was pretty impressive. Like it was, we just sort of sat in the office and had like a bit of a chat. And then I remember going back to the same university lecture and him saying, oh, how did it go? And I was like, oh yeah, it went really well, actually. It was just like a chat. We just sat and had a chat. And he was like, you know, that's to catch you off guard, right? So you'll say something more naturally than if you were in an interview. It was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. <laughs> so God only knows what I said, but it was obviously okay. And you got the job. Yeah. Was there any motor racing in your family? No, no, I'd never been to a race. Like, and even for all of the, the bike racing and the car racing that's in Northern Ireland, I'd never done any of those things. Dad would have watched the Formula One, but, but you would have never... You didn't sit down with him? Well, I would have watched some of them. At that stage, you didn't think of working in it. You know, when... Formula One was being shown years ago. They, you weren't showing the pit wall and you weren't showing the race engineer and you weren't listening to the comms between the two and you weren't really thinking of the car designer. You were just thinking of the driver and I knew I wasn't going to be a driver so I just didn't really think about the jobs that were possible in Formula One. I know that sounds stupid now but I didn't imagine a strategist on the pit wall deciding when the pit stops were happening. I didn't imagine a race engineer deciding what the car setup should be. It just You just didn't think about that. Have you heard about the new Ferrari movie? It's all about Enzo, the founder of the company. It's in cinemas this Christmas, and critics are calling it the best car movie ever made. It's the story of Enzo Ferrari fighting to save his empire and his marriage, all while trying to win the legendary Milli Miglia, the treacherous 1,000-mile road race across Italy. It's directed by Michael Mann, and the cast is absolutely stellar. Adam Driver plays Enzo Ferrari, Penelope Cruz is his wife, Laura, and Patrick Dempsey is the driver, Piero Taruffi. The other stars of this movie are the cars. So many beautiful Ferraris from the 1950s, and the engine sounds so good on big cinema speakers. It's like you're sitting at the side of the track. 
If you've ever looked at the Ferraris during a race and wondered about the man who created the company, this is a must watch. Ferrari fires on all cylinders. It opens exclusively in theatres this Christmas and you can get your tickets now. Were there many women doing STEM subjects at Queen's Belfast? So I think in my final year, the, it was about 10%, which is actually pretty good. I went to an all-girls secondary school and then went to uni, so it was a big step. But somehow I, that didn't really phase me. I didn't think too much about that. And I enjoyed what I was doing, so it didn't really matter to me so much, that aspect of it. It's got a lot better now, I think. It's definitely got better in F1 now than it was then. Well, just in the strategy departments. I mean, there was you, there was there's Ruth Buscombe, who is yeah. head of strategy at Alfa Romeo, Rosie Waite at Mercedes. Yeah. Hannah Schmitz is, yeah. is one of two leading the Red Bull charge. There's 50% of the pit walls have a female on it regularly for strategy. So for in strategy, it's very strong. I think the only thing is that in that background team, you know, like in my background team, I was only female. The same in Red Bull, the same in Mercedes, I think. So there's maybe one out of the team. It just so happens that that one is the person on the pit wall. So still the ratio in the, in the team isn't great, I think. Um, was that intimidating? I never found it intimidating. I find that there was advantages to being the only female. You know, if I think back to the McLaren graduate scheme, they interviewed 10 of us in that assessment centre. I was the only female. So I imagine when they were discussing how X, Y, Z had done in the assessment centre, it was easy to say, oh, well, she was the only girl. Like, how do you think she did? Whereas if you're talking about a David or a John, you know, it's like, oh, which one is he? Is he the tall one or the one, you know, like it's much more complicated. And then on the pit wall, when I speak, people know it's me. Like there's no question mark of who's the female on the pit wall. It's obvious it's me. So some things, that, you know, it was beneficial. Do you think Formula One is doing enough to get more women, more women studying the STEM subjects? I think the things that are helping are the visibility that we're getting now. So the visibility of people like myself or people like Hannah when she goes to the podium and things. So it's slow, but that's the most natural way of doing it. Because any of us, if you ask any of us that are on the pit wall from a strategy point of view, we all got the jobs because we were the best candidate in each of our representative positions, rather than the team felt they needed to be 50-50, so they needed to hire a girl. And I don't think any of us would wish to change that. But it's about encouraging enough kids, girls, parents, whatever, to say engineering is not this male job that it used to be. And particularly in the UK, I think there's almost when, you know, initially when I said to people about being an engineer, people assume you're in a boiler suit. People don't think of the designer. So we need to sort of correct the image of engineering a little bit. But I think it is just about getting that visibility, showing the females on the pit wall, showing the females in the garbage, as mechanics, whatever the case may be. We need to sort of try and encourage former students a good way of doing that, those types of things that institutions are doing well. You were very driven, though, because I'm filling in the gaps here, but you go to McLaren thanks to Formula Student. You are a designer, but you want to go trackside. Yeah. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I think you then took it upon yourself to get experience in other formulas is that right yeah so at that time mclaren had built the 12c the gt3 version and they had this car that wasn't very reliable that they were trying to get trackside in gt3 program a guy called mark williams who was an ex-race engineer for mclaren came up with this project of people who wanted to volunteer could go and help race teams so I did weekend warrioring, basically, at GT3, trying to get the car on the program. But it got to a point where I was taking days off on a Friday from work in Gearbox World to go to a track somewhere to race engineer a car for the weekend to then come back on Monday. So it was just, it was pretty relentless what you were trying to do to get some track experience, to prove that you were good enough the track. And then as well as that, I ended up in their mission control, like we talked about the volunteers for strategy, you know, in, in Aston, ended up volunteering in mission control for like a vehicle dynamics role from um, McLaren, all just to get into 
doing the trackside stuff. And then when Tom Stallard, who's race engineer there now, went on paternity leave in 2013, I was given the opportunity to be his replacement for those two races with Jensen. And and that's all where it led to. And yeah, it was very determined because to take that route from design engineer to performance engineer to strategy engineer is very abnormal. They're not normal career moves. I think it made me a lot much stronger strategist to understand the other elements, but they're not normal moves. So I had to work pretty hard, particularly the design to the performance one. You know, I guess the saying is jacket of all trades, master of none. But like, well, even when I think when I moved to strategy, the reason I was strong at, at that then was because I'd had all this performance engineering experience. So I understood all the engine modes. I understood all the fuel and aspects. You understand all a lot of these other things that are happening in the race that are affecting strategy, but not necessarily in strategy world. So, yeah, I think it was and I wouldn't change it. It was difficult. For sure, it was difficult. And there was some tough times. Like I I race engineered Zach Brown (laughs) in GT3. It was amazing. But we had one race in particular. I don't even know where the race was now, but we had one race in particular. GT3, there is a set pit stop window. You have 10 minutes, I think, to stop in. It is not difficult strategy. You are told when to stop. But you're always trying to maximize the performance of the pro in the car and and, minimize the stint for it. And just whatever way I'd worked it out, I thought we had one more lap. So I sent the car around one more lap. And it's that moment where the car goes by and every other car, every single other car comes into the pit lane. And I'm like, ah. Oh. Did you realize immediately? If me, once, the, once the pit lane's full with every other car, you're like, oh, we don't have enough time to get back around, do we? And we took like a 10 minute pit stop or, or 10 minute penalty or something ridiculous. How was Zach after the race? He was actually better than I thought he was going to be. I think he just accepted that nothing could be done at that point. And we change, you know, whatever spreadsheet I was using to try and make it better. But it wasn't a great start to strategy when you can't hit the window you're given. Zach is a decent peddler, actually, isn't he? He was, he was really good. I had to push him pretty hard. He was pretty non-committed at times. Would hardly ever do a track walk. And I was trying to push him to do it. But nobody in GT3 really is doing a track walk. But So he felt it was unnecessary. The McLaren GT was always really hot. So he was always really struggling with that. Um, but he, I found him, you know, I'm sure he's a very hard businessman. But I found him actually reasonably easy. It's his fun weekend, isn't it? Will you ever go back to the pit wall? I did love my job. I love what I did on the pit wall. I love the effect I had on the race. So never say never, you know, and even when I was leaving, I thought never say never. But I'm enjoying this new life. And everyone I've met so far has been very grateful of the explanation of strategy and engineering and things that they're getting. So as long as that continues, let's see where it goes. Is there one team on the grid that you thought, I'd like to work for them. No, just because I actually really loved the team I worked with at Aston and the people. And I thought I felt like a very good environment to work within. Obviously, it would be great to stand on the podium. Like, I've never done that. And I'm not now going to do that. You know, that would be great. If I could steal Hannah's job just for the one race <laughs> and do that, that would be perfect. But I probably wouldn't do as good a job as Hannah. So, But yeah, you know, there, you're, you're obviously... You've missed those opportunities or some of those opportunities for sure. But am I going to gain a lot as a person by putting myself in the pressure to do those things? I don't I don't know. Well, Bernie, thank you. Good luck with everything. Thank that you. Comes up. What a brilliant chat. Thank you, Bernie. And were she to return to the pit wall in future, never say never remember. She'd be a huge asset to any team. Clearly, she's an expert in strategy and engineering, but she's also a great team player. That's something all of the guys at Aston tell me. But personally, I hope Bernie stays on this side of the fence with F1 and Sky. I think she brings a huge amount of insight and understanding to the fans that wasn't previously there. And given that you're listening to her on this show, look out for her contributions on the F1 Explains podcast as well. I loved what Bernie had to say about some of the drivers she's worked with. Checo, a great tyre manager. 
Sebastian, the best strategic brain of any driver she's worked with, and I really giggled at the thought of her as a performance engineer at McLaren, leaving Jensen bits of advice on post-it notes. Bernie, it was great to catch up. Many thanks for your time, and I'll see you again at a race soon. So what did you make of the conversation with Bernie? Do you want to see her back on the pit wall or staying as a pundit? Let me know through all the usual means. I'm at Tom Clarkson F1 on X, or you can use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which, as ever, brings me on to what you sent in about Franz Tost after last week's show. Franz, who retired as a Formula One team principal in Abu Dhabi last weekend. There's a lot of love for Franz out there, and rightly so. And here are some of your messages. Let's start with this from Zayn Marie. Franz will be missed by all. Not as memorable as Ron Dennis from McLaren or Jean Todd from Ferrari or even Christian Horner from the high-tier Red Bull racing team. But he was his own character and built his team his way. And that's what set him apart from the rest. Well, thanks for the note, Zayn. And yes, Franz was definitely his own man and he deserves our respect. And what about this from Anthony Hall? Great interview, straight answer tossed. He never leaves you in doubt about what he wants. His answers are concise and from our little exposure, usually correct. It'll be interesting to see who he recommends to replace him because most likely his choice is correct yet again. Well, thanks for getting in touch, Anthony. And it probably won't come as a surprise to learn that two people are needed to replace Franz. Laurel Mechies as team principal and Peter Bayer as CEO. What a man Franz was. And finally, his Saluki convert. I went to Bahrain testing earlier this year and guess who I saw running around the hotel's courtyard super early in the morning? <laughs> well, no prizes for guessing there. Of course it was Franz. And you know what? He'll have run the track later that day as well. He is a fitness freak. We'll leave it there for messages this week and please remember to get in touch with your thoughts and stories about Bernie Collins in time for next week's show. And on that subject, we have just one more episode of F1 Beyond the Grid left in 2023. How time flies. We're certainly going to finish on a high, so I'll see you again next week and thanks for listening as ever. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out.